Um, I just wanted to give you a couple of bits of context. This map is from BP, and this is what the world would look like if the size of countries was proportional to the size of the oil reserves they had. Now, you can see from this the sheer importance of the Persian Gulf region, um, which between five countries has about 60% of the world's oil reserves. Iraq itself, right at the heart of this region, has 10%. This is a quick history of modern Iraq told through Iraq's share of world oil production. Well, what we've been repeatedly told over the last 10 years is that Iraq desperately needed the Western multinationals to develop its oil industry. Well, the, the Western multinationals were there once before, and that's this first period. And you see what the line does there. It heads downwards. This point is nationalization or the beginning of nationalization in 1972. And what you see after that is a, a significant increase. In fact, production more than doubled during this period, once Iraqis took control of their own oil industry. And Iraq, in terms of exploration, it found more oil during this period than the rest of the world combined. And then the rest of, of, the, of the period, running up until the last couple of years, what we see is successful development of the oil industry, rising production, and then a war happens, and it, and it gets destroyed and, and goes back down to, um, to very low. And each time, what the Iraqis did was rebuilding it. Um, the Iraqi oil engineer has a very special quality, I think. Um, one of the senior um, leaders of, of the Iraqi oil industry once said to me, we weren't engineers, we were craftsmen. And the reason he said that is because each of these times during wars, during sanctions, they managed to rebuild their industry. Here, before the war with Iran had even finished, they were rebuilding. Here, while sanctions were still underway, they were rebuilding. They were rebuilding through sheer ingenuity, cobbling together bits of parts. They couldn't import equi equipment properly from overseas, and yet they kept it running enough to serve the country during this period, and then with the Oil for Food program, it started to increase again. I want to try and tell you four things in 12 minutes. Um, and these are the four things I want to tell you about. 2003, how the Iraqi oil industry was destroyed. 2006, 2007, how the surge was closely tied to uh, an effort to get the oil companies into Iraq. During that same period, the resistance by Iraqi trade unions against those efforts, and then a little bit about where we are now. You might be wondering what this has to do with Iraq. If you give me a moment, I'll explain to you. Um, I want to talk first about the destruction of the Iraqi oil industry in 2003. As we know, the Americans and Brits arrived in March, April, and they brought with them their friends, their, fr their Iraqi friends, who had most, many of whom had been outside the country for a period of decades. Um, one example, the most famous at the time, was Ahmed Chalabi, who had left Iraq in 1958. Um, now, they brought these, their friends with them, and they put their friends into government, first in the governing council and then in the appointment of ministers in September of that year. When um, a new Iraqi oil minister was appointed in September, one of the first things he did was get rid of all the people who were there already and bring in his own friends and his own members of his party and members of his sect. Now, the people who were running the oil industry, many of them had been there since the, since the 1960s, some even longer, they were the ones who had built up the industry in the 1970s. They'd learned how to run the industry during all those difficulties of wars and sanctions. And they were very effective at it. They were not engineers, they were craftsmen. In their place came a bunch of friends and family of the minister, one of whom, and here's the reason for the picture, one of whom, his, his principal qualification, he'd, he'd been living in Denmark, his principal qualification was as a pizza chef and he was brought in to help run the Iraqi oil industry in place of these, these, these men who had 30, 40 years of experience and were respected across the region. So in 2007, as we know, President Bush announced a new strategy in Iraq. He, he sent a surge of an extra 30,000 troops. Now, it's, it's, this is generally thought about as something to try and achieve security in Iraq. That's certainly how, how the Bush administration sold it. If you look closely at it, in fact, it was, it was part of a two-part strategy. Part one, send the extra troops to try and achieve control over Iraq. Part two, use that extra control 
to pressure Iraqi politicians to deliver what they call benchmarks, markers of political progress. And there was one benchmark that they kept pushing, and that was to pass an oil law which would give primary control over the majority of Iraq's oil to foreign multinationals. So the, the surge happened in um, January 2007. By that stage, the oil law had been drafted. It was approved by the Iraqi cabinet in, in February of that year. And it still had to get, get through the parliament in order to become law. And so during the course of 2007, while the extra troops were there, the Americans were pushing and pushing and saying, when are you going to pass this oil law? Every time a, a senior member of the Bush administration went to Iraq or met Iraqi leaders, it was all they talked about. Here you have the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense, a couple of examples, but this, this was constant and continuous. Bush was talking to Maliki every two weeks, and he was, con he was constantly saying, where is our oil law? Congress passed a, a, an act in um, April, May of 2007, which made further reconstruction funds flowing to Iraq conditional on the passage of an oil law. Maliki said in, in around March of 2007, he understood very clearly from American officials that if they didn't get their oil law, they would be looking to remove him from office. And so there was this intense pressure to pass an oil law that would have put Western multinationals in charge of Iraqi oil for the first time in, um, in more than 30 years. And in, in order to get this through, the Americans also tried to deepen the sectarianization of, of Iraqi politics. It was already pretty bad at that stage. What they tried to do was they tried to move authority away from the cabinet and away from the parliament towards the president, the vice presidents, and the prime minister. And so a, a team of, of five friends of, of the US were positioned to get this oil law passed and to take more extensive control of Iraq. This is a friend of mine. He's, um, his name is Hassan Juma. He, he's the leader of the oil workers trade union in Basra. Um, in December 2006, I attended a meeting with the leaders of all of Iraq's trade union federations. Um, on the subject of the oil law, which had just been drafted at that stage. And what he said was, oh, Prime Minister Maliki promised that he would uh, consult with trade unions and civil society about the oil law. Now he's saying he's not going to. And that was sufficiently provocative that the, um, the, the unionists started to talk about what they were going to do about this, not just about the bad news, but how they were going to fight it. And so over the course of a two-and-a-half-day meeting, we, they came up with a strategy for how they would fight the oil law. Actually, this was a remarkable period. In early 2007, given the sheer weight of political pressure that was put by the Americans to get this oil law passed, I couldn't see any prospect of it not being passed. It looked like it was inevitable. But the trade unionists, they started organizing. And this became a massive popular issue. The Americans set a deadline for passing the oil law of September 2007. And they failed to meet it. The oil law wasn't passed because it was a popular issue and Iraqi civil society managed to organize against it. The Iraqi oil law still hasn't passed today. And in fact, not only did they fail to get their oil law in September 2007, I think since that was the point where US control over Iraq started to decline. The, um, the final thing I want to talk about is where is the oil industry now? This is a picture of a SIM card from Lithuania. <laughs> The Iraqi oil industry today I characterize as a, as a gold rush. The, they didn't get their oil law, and so in the absence of an oil law, there is no legal basis for multinationals to operate in the Iraqi oil industry. Nonetheless, they are operating there, as you probably know. They arrived mostly in early 2010, and now the majority of the Iraqi oil industry is run by the likes of BP, Shell, Exxon, some Chinese com companies, a Russian company, and so on. Since they operate without a legal basis, as I say, um, under agreements with the Iraqi government, and I imagine those agreements will last as long as the Iraqi government does. But since the multinationals arrived, the levels of corruption have skyrocketed. They were already terrible. They, the, Corruption in the Iraqi oil industry started to grow bad during the sanctions era in the 1990s, 
got a hell of a lot worse under the coalition, coalition provisional authority in 2003, continued to get worse under the current crop of po politicians, but accelerated a fourth time when the multinationals arrived. Two of the Western multinationals, one Italian and one Australian, are being investigated, one for paying bribes, one for receiving bribes. The case involving the Italian company, Eni, was a complex scheme involving Lithuanian SIM cards in mobile phones, hence the picture, and they were using these because they were untraceable in their receipt, re receipt of bribes. At the same time, the rights of workers are being routinely violated. Workers aren't being paid what's due them. Their salaries are being paid late. Special bonuses aren't being paid at all. And so there are numerous protests against the Western oil companies. Coming back to Hassan Juma, he was recently arrested again for about the fourth time. His crime is having organized protests in the South Oil Company. Now, we were told that the, um, the invasion of Iraq brought liberation. It brought an end to dictatorship and brought democracy. Saddam Hussein's laws making it illegal to organize in trade unions are still in force and are routinely used by the new Iraqi government. Hassan is facing prosecution simply for having organized protests. He might get up to three years in prison for, for doing so. I would like you to put your name to a petition against the prosecution of Hassan Juma. This is my website, and on this website, it will tell you how to put your name on the petition. Click on that link. <laughs> and Hassan Juma will go to court equipped with this petition, telling him that he isn't alone, that he still has the support of people around the world, he still has our solidarity, and he will pass that message to the judge. This is a politicized trial, and we can take action in this case to help steer Iraq away from its current trend towards increasing authoritarianism. I'd really encourage you to take this action. I think I've gone on a little too long. <laughs>